For those of you who haven't figured out who I am yet, I'm Alistair Meredith. I currently work for Bloomberg on uh, their internal standard library implementations and our open source BDE project. Uh, for my sins in the past life, I was the library working group chair for the ISO committee from around about 2011 through 2015. So I basically shepherded us through the C++14 era. And then happily handed off to Marshall to do all the real work. Okay, so that's me. What's this talk? Um, this was me sitting down about 12 months ago thinking we're just about to get C++17 out the door. And um, wh where are we going next? Um, I'm terrible at this. I always make a get, talk myself ahead of where I know I've got a slide coming in four slides at a time. But, um, one of the things we did for C++17 was I put in a paper to say let's reserve a namespace for a future standard library because we're growing increasingly concerned about some of the defects and incompatibilities and concerns and things just not feeling quite as clean as they should in the current standard library that's accumulated over 20 years. So we reserved the namespace, or we did a whole family of namespaces, STD followed by any sequence of digits, but notionally we're going to call it STD2 at this point. Um, so we have a space where we can maybe do something new. And having cleared out that space, my goal was then thinking for, we still don't know when we're going to fill that. There's no commitment that we're going to start putting things in there in C++20 or even C++23. But we've just reserved the namespace so people know that we would like to do some work. And if you were sitting in that namespace, you might want to plan your exit sometime in the next few years. So then I thought, well, what are we going to do with that wonderful new namespace? And if we're going to create a new library, we really want to be sure that any language features that might impact our library design land sooner rather than later so we build from the right bricks. And that was the essence of this talk saying, if I'm thinking about a new library coming down the line, what are the key language features that might impact library design I really want to see landing so we can get an effort behind getting those into C++20. And hopefully I can inspire a vision between this group here as well, because this is a great place to come to have folks who are focused on designing and building what might be that next great library. It was essentially the original mission statement of Boost was to find new resources to, and develop future standard libraries. So I'm really hoping that I'm at the right audience to be presenting this talk. Uh, but note I must make, this is my own personal vision. None of this is at all endorsed or even seen at the moment by the ISO working group. And similar with Bloomberg, I've got a lot of folks around Bloomberg who I hope will agree with a bunch of what I'm saying, but it is by no means, this is the Bloomberg vision for C++20. This is just my own personal idea, and it's guaranteed in many ways to be wrong. Which is why, I'm pitching this for three seconds. Today we're going to talk about language features and how they might have an impact on the future library design. Tomorrow I'm going to go through what I think the mission for that library design should be, some of the things we might do in there, what the content should be. And then on Friday, I'm going to turn things around. And I want feedback from the group here to find out not what my vision is, but what the vision for the committee should be. So hopefully I can get some, steal some co-authors to come on board and we can write a, a document trying to outline a vision that we can take to the committee in a paper either at Toronto or the meeting after that. So that's my goal for Friday, which is probably an ambitious goal, but I need smart people's visions, not my vision. My vision will go nowhere. <laughs> or steer us off into the weeds somewhere. We need more eyes and a consensus so that there's a, a real driving of vision in, in a single direction. So that was the plan. And the inspiration for the new library, if we look back at the C++ OX11 timeframe, we had this wonderful idea for a language feature called concepts that some of you might have heard about. And we spent a considerable amount of time in the library working group applying concepts to the existing standard library. And then we did more work and more work because we had a vision that in order to be successful as the language went out with the upgraded library, we had to be source compatible with what came before. We ended up creating an awful lot of really fine grained concepts that effectively said any, any syntax that the existing lazy unconstrained templates would swallow would be swallowed by the new 
library, and we wrote in fine detail exactly what we thought used to be, swa be accepted, and effectively took out all the abstraction by specifying it in very fine detail. And we were really vanishing in the weeds. This didn't feel the right way to go. And there was an unspoken consent, not quite consensus, but you know, notion that maybe we would really need to do a new library that wasn't necessarily source compatible when it was time to apply concepts when they came back to the, to the standard library. And that was my notion of what STD2 would be. So why now? Now with C++17, we've reserved that namespace, so other people will be looking at that namespace with glee and having their visions of what they're going to put into it. And that's a good thing. But it would be really good to coordinate those visions early, which is, as I said, the reason for this talk. And those visions go way beyond, in some cases, just applying concepts to the standard library. There's all these little things that have been niggling for years that now is our chance to fix them. And if we fix too many, maybe we'll give up too much compatibility. If we don't fix any, maybe we have a lot of dissatisfied customers. And maybe we don't put this into that, that library at all. We'll talk about that tomorrow. I say, so why this talk on the language features? The new library, if we have a new library, wants to be cut from whole cloth. So any language features or things we, we know are missing that we expect to come into the language, we want them early so we build from the right components from the ground up. We don't want to be bolting on too many things afterwards. Because they just never quite fit right. We did a fairly good job, I think, with 11 of getting move semantics and things in there. And there's also some tension in some of these features. And if we look at the concurrency library, there's definitely desires there that if we got to do it over, we'd do some of those things quite differently. So how do I pick the features for this talk? There's many language features that we're looking at, of course, for the next few standards. So I wanted to focus on features that would have a big library impact, either in how we render the interfaces, the kind of abstractions we can express, and therefore the vocabulary we want to build out of, or things that would fundamentally affect how we might organize the library. Okay, there's only really one feature for that, but probably the first one I'm going to talk about. Um, so the format of this talk, I'm assuming I'm a, talking to an audience of folks who are very active or involved in C++ discussions online and so forth. So you've probably got a fair idea about a lot of the language features I'm going to be talking about today. So in keeping with my usual inbred themes, this is not an in-depth tutorial on any of these features. But rather than introducing them, to an extent I'm going to assume you know a reasonable of it. Maybe not in detail, but you'll have a, enough to follow along without me having to drill into all the niceties of all the different features we'll be looking at. We've got somewhere between a half dozen to nine, ten features we'll, hopefully I'll get through. So, first feature I was talking about language design, uh, library distribution is modules. This has been a bugbear for a long time. At, um, the model of building and distributing C++ code just doesn't cut it in the modern world. We just have a system where we just concatenate code after code after code through the preprocessor and we hit the file system hard and it's just not the right way to build and deliver libraries. So I think that modules is probably the single most fundamental change that could be coming to the library. Perhaps not in the way the kind of things we're expressing but it's certainly if we're thinking of a new library we should be thinking of it in terms of what modules will we, will we be putting in there rather than what headers in terms of the interface. Uh, as a light, so coming back to the language feature, um, modules yeah, it affects essentially every library entity because you want to expose them all, th all through your module interface, so that now becomes the way we're distributing code. So it affects everything. And I will talk later about whether macros are part of the interface that come through here, because that's still not clear. So, indeed. So, current state of the art. Um, Clang has been shipping a notion of modules that was developed uh, initially at Apple about five years ago and is now being actively developed from, by some of the folks at Google. Um, they've got a model that views 
has taken a big concern about backwards compatibility for a transition from old to new. Uh, their model looks at saying, we already have a module system in C++ or even C. You just pass each header file as if it were a unique entity. And then you can start doing smarter things about caching how those past header files ha have been seen by the compiler. And that, that was the basis of their approach. Microsoft have been looking at this much more as a library-like abstraction for shipping a lot of the way they've been distributing code. And I'll be honest here, I've been looking much more at the Microsoft implementation of late. So all my experience with modules that I'm going to talk through in a little bit comes to the Microsoft notion. So as far as the ISO committee is concerned, we've got these two groups pulling in maybe different directions, such as we'll talk about the macro issue. And we're trying to pull them together in a consensus of the best common set of features we can ship. And that's what we're about to try to vote out as a TS some meeting soon. We thought we were going to get it out at Kona and there was a little bit less consensus than we thought right at the end. So we're gonna have another go in, um, in Toronto in July. And from what I hear now, GCC are also getting on board, trying to implement not the Microsoft or the, um, the Quang model, but just what the TS specifies. So that'll be a great third, third implementation that hopefully will be around. I'm not sure if we'll make GCC 8, I hope so, but sometime in the middle future. So what's a module? It's, I'm calling it a library level abstraction. It's a collection of multi multiple translation units that you access through a single import to that module directive. And my view here, this is, as I say, aligning much more to the Microsoft than the, uh, the Quang view at this point, is it's you're exporting C++ code. So you're exporting the compiled abstraction of that C++ code. And because hopefully you've got a single module for all that content in there, you hit the file system once, you import that module interface, and now you've got all the information you need. You're not doing lots of fine-grained hash include, hash include, hash include that kills a lot of our build process today. So basic syntax, what does a module look like? Um, this is kind of our, our interface unit. We have a module followed by an identifier that names the module. Uh, export namespace blah. So blah is my namespace in this case. Doesn't need to be the same as the module name. It's just in that namespace I'm saying I'm exporting everything you see in that namespace. So in there we put function declarations and class definitions. And we can export multiple namespaces and that is the interface to your module. And if I then want to access other modules or from this module or indeed um, use the contents of this module, import that module is equivalent to just all the hash includes, it says make that available. Question? Just a clarification to follow basic syntax. Yes. Export can apply to any declaration. Am I on the right? I've got backwards. Ah, just, just in case yeah. people might get an impression of form for namespaces. Export can okay. be applied to any declaration. Okay, so it's kind of like an, an external language linkage. You say everything within this block Expert is, but and you can do them individually as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, as I said, this is not my in-depth, and I'm very happy to have lots of corrections as I go. Uh, I keep hitting the wrong button, going backwards and forwards here. Ah, and oh, please repeat the question, because I always fail to see that sign. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Go was just making a clarification that for, um, if I go back to my code slide, can I get the right button? Um, I say here that we've got export namespace just to simplify exporting a bunch of things at once, but you can put export in front of any declaration or class definition, and that would then be exported. In fact, if you put it in front of a forward declaration of a class, you would export just the forward declaration and not the definition of that class, which is an interesting thing to be aware of. Question that I must remember to repeat. So the question is, if I export a single function, does the entire overload set of that function get exported? That's a great question that I don't know the answer to, so I'm going to ask Gore. <laughs> Gore concurred with my answer. <laughs> Uh, 
from the way I've from the way I've been looking at the specification, my suspicion is it would just export the overloads that you export. And I mean, if you, if you have you just say, you know, as, I, as yeah. I said to Gaspar, is that are you are you exporting a, a definition or are you exporting an identifier? No. You ex the question is, are you exporting a definition or you're exporting an identifier? I believe you're exporting a declaration. Sorry, that's what I meant. Declaration. So you're not. I say it's not like you know using SDD colon colon swap and suddenly I've got that name and anything in that overload set comes in. I'm saying export this specific declaration. So I, th I believe, though I'm sure Gore will correct me shortly, <laughs> that it would export just a single declaration. Yes, yeah, so the class definite, so the question is, can you repeat the question? Because When you talk about the linker, I get confused. The question, okay, the question is, uh, what does the, the, the export export? And you said it exports declarations, and it says it yeah. in there, and class definitions. So that slide answers yeah. my question. Yes, it exports definitions where the linker doesn't yeah. get involved. So you're, you're all good. You can say it exports declarations and definitions where the linker isn't mm -hmm. involved. That's all. So the repeat, he says, what, what the module is exporting is declarations and definitions where the linker would not get involved today, just as seen by the front end. Question at the back. But also definitions in the case of templates or auto functions. He's cool. Or like <laughs> I tried to keep yes, I, <laughs> uh, it's a clarification about templates that I'm really trying to duck because I haven't played deeply enough with templates to be giving authoritative answers. So I have, and also the question that, you know, return auto where you've got a the signature is based upon the de deduce from the definition. Uh, to broadcast some clarification on the answer. So uh, export a declaration, export several <coughs> things. It exports the name so mm -hmm. that now uh, name lookup will mm -hmm. become available for this thing. But it also exports the entities mm -hmm. themselves because it's possible that you export mm -hmm. the type def, but there is also a thing which it points to. Mm -hmm. It has no longer a name that you can explicitly claim, mm -hmm. but you can get to it via different type. So a entity mm -hmm. plus names. Okay, so we're saying what we're exporting is entities, which is a very precise C++ term. I'm going to make no attempt to define at this point. <laughs> I think it's everything but a macro uh, and, uh, and names. Um, and the specific example we're given was if we're exporting a type def, uh, the type def is aliasing another type, and the, therefore you can act, get to the type that is being aliased through the type def name. I'm going to regret asking Gore this because I want to move on to the next slide, but if I'm aliasing a type that is not exported with my type def, you will get to it. I will still have access to the type that's not exported. Because you can always say because, because I have access the to the, okay. Can, no. can Okay, I'm going to quickly hit my, repeat my point there and move on. So, but just clarifying from Gore, wonderful having the language expert in the room with you. Um, if we type def uh, a declaration that isn't, or a type that isn't exported out of the module, the type is not exported, but the type is still accessible through the type def name, because if I were to use something like decal type, or go through a template deduction using that of something that was declared using that type def, it will still have to find the type that we've not exported with that name, but I guess we... That is an entity. We exported an entity which is unnamed <laughs> plus declaration slapped a name on that entity. So if I export a local class, yeah. I've got a name, but I don't know any... It's like a forward declaration because I don't know what the methods are. Okay, we've gone too deep down the hole. I need to move on. <laughs> I want to talk about that after the, after the talk, slides. Okay. So module contents. We've got a single interface file that declares all the interface of the module in a single place. So that makes it much easier to find and query and know what you're dealing with with your module. Uh, the definitions for all the exported contents, which could, could be organized through multiple translation units or assembled to build that module. Uh, additional declarations and definitions that we use to implement the contents of the module, but that are not exported. 
and therefore those symbols are not visible to other modules. So we've really gone private and hidden in a way that we can't do in C++ <coughs> 17. And this effectively means we can, these private entities are not bound via the ODR across multiple modules, but they're clearly bound via the ODR in the module that, that they're in. So that is a slightly liberating thing that helps gain some real benefit and traction moving forward with this as an implementation detail. Module constraints, what, what are the limits of what you can do with a module? Uh, again, I'm not sure if this is common with Microsoft and Clang, because I'm just working with the Microsoft system at the moment, but you're not allowed cycles between the modules. The import cycle you get from your, mo your modules must form a directed acyclic graph. Um, therefore, mutually dependent classes that uh, you know, somehow interact have to reside in the same module. So you can still do this, but they will live in the same module. Still multiple transworking units within the same module, that's permitted, but they will live in the same module. And as I said, templates, maybe you can poke around and instantiate things in clever ways to get around this. I've not played around with the templates too much, but if you look at the import cycle of the, gra of the module graph, that's still going to be acyclic. Could you explain how you have separate translation units in a module? How does that work? Because modules, I'm coming, oh, you're coming to it. Okay. Okay. Indeed, could be the next slide. How to split a module? How do we sp split the contents into multiple translation units and assemble a single module? Um, in particular, how do the different translation units that are def providing class definitions? see the or implementations of the methods, see the definition of the class itself that was in that interface file, then do we want to import our own module? That makes no sense. Um, we could assemble it with falling back on old hash include tricks so that I write the interface file one way and then directly hash include to get it, but that won't work directly because I'm not allowed to use export apart from in the interface file. Uh, maybe some other syntax is needed here or perhaps we just move the smarts into the build system and say every time I see a file which has the word module, I know it's part of that module. One of those files is special and is the interface definition file and we have to tell the build system, this is how you recognize the interface definition file for the module and here's everything else that's going to build it. And therefore it knows whenever I see module blah, okay, I need to find the interface definition for module blah because that's going to have declarations I need when I pass this to you. It means that we don't have a clear answer here yet. The question is, you know, does that mean that we assemble our module from traditional header and CPP file pairs? Not necessarily. And this is part of what we're going to tease out of the experience we get with the modules TS. Sorry. So in the, the Clang or the, the Microsoft case, are you generating the, the module file from the uh, the translation units, or are you constructing it yourself? So the question is, are we generating the module file? And by that, I guess you mean the interface the, file. The interface file itself. Is yeah. either are we generating it, or are we basically writing it ourselves? Yeah. And my, the, the way I've been experience I've been having at the moment is we're writing it ourselves. <laughs> and I'm going to get shortly. I need to get going. I'm almost half an hour in. I've got a fair bit to get through still. Um, So, well, I, I say, I, I'm, I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going to, I've actually got some Bloomberg experience I'm going to talk about there, which covers some of this in a couple of slides' time. Open questions one. Can a module export a macro? And this is very much where we get to my preference, having been persuaded by talking specifically to Gabriel Dos Rice, who completely did me a 180 on this, is I no longer see macros as part of what intuitively should be exported from a, uh, a module. Macros, to my worldview here, again, my vision, 
Um, they're manipulating source code at a direct character level. They're manipulating the source text. They're not manipulating code. Whereas what modules are exporting are everything you see after phase one of translation, where it's you know, real C++ abstractions and entities, and by this point, the preprocessor is not involved, which doesn't mean macros are a useless thing that should just go away. It just means that if you're doing something at the preprocessor level, it's natural to use the preprocessor to invoke a way to do that. And hash include already gives us that. So my vision here in you know, the end result way down the line when the whole world is beautiful and working with modules is that if you wish to define macros, you would put them into a header file and perhaps distribute that alongside your module so that if folks want to use those macros, they can also bring them into just the translation unit they care about with the traditional hash include. And these will be distinctly rarer. Whether that works through a transition scenario might be a harder thing to sell. Question? Why not just uh, with that vision mm -hmm. stuff like that? If, if they're just becoming preprocessor mm -hmm. sort of manipulations where they're just manipulating yep. the text, don't call them include, maybe even call it something else like hash preprocessor. Well, we, we don't need to. So the suggestion is why not come up with, you know, if they're just, you know, files with a bunch of macros, why still use hash include? Just, you know, have a hash preprocessor or a different directive to import them. <coughs> and there's no need. Hash include does exactly the right thing. The only problem with hash include in the legacy world is hash include has lots of things in there that are not um, macros as well. And then we start running into ODR violations if they happen to have class definitions or... Um. One thing you already mentioned in here about macros that is important to me is that uh, macros go both ways. When you import a module, mm -hmm. um, I've, at least all the mm -hmm. proposals I've seen, when you, when you, when you say import a module, mm -hmm. it doesn't look at any of the macro definitions you have outstanding. Mm -hmm. that, that it's independent on if you pound define you know, C++ le language mm -hmm. level or anything like that. It's, it, those are, it's, it doesn't matter, but then there's also macros that get exported from, possibly from that. Yeah. So macros don't go into modules, but they may come out. Okay, may, so may is your open question. Yep. Uh, emphasize. Just repeating the question, emphasizing the may that if we have macros being exported out of modules, you're not necessarily going to be chaining the whole world of the macros that were imported by the module that is then exporting its own set, it would only be exporting the macros it directly exported. So it still cleans up our experience with, mod with macros. And stuff Question. like the cache defined private yeah. public with modules. <laughs> and comment about the, the traditional Machiavellian hash divine private public, maybe we finally fix that, and maybe not. But <laughs> so Question at the back, very quickly. So the question is, can I have a header file that just does a hash import, and then I include the module, the header file, and the, the header file is now doing the import on my behalf? And the answer is yes, and I suspect that might be a good way of achieving a module compatibility layer between C++ 17's headers and maybe a modularized C++ library in the future. It may be that we choose a new library as modules and the old one is headers, and that's just what falls out of what we've got. This is, as I said, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. So open question two, this comes partly back to what we were hearing earlier, is must the, again, the distinction between the Microsoft and the Quang approach at the moment is, must the module declaration, that module identifier that says I'm part of this module, be the first substantive line, so not a comment, um, not a hash include that does anything other than define macros, because that's not substantive. All you're doing is you're playing around with the preprocessor. You've not actually got code there yet. But the first substantive line uh, must that be the module declaration? And then the compiler knows I'm passing a module or I'm in the old world. And we've got one view, one view that says, you know, there's nothing special about the module declaration. It can appear anywhere in the source file. And there's another that says, no, it really makes our compilation model much simpler if it comes first. And that's one of those open questions that we're going to be learning about as we, from the experience we get doing the uh, modules uh, TS, I believe. Open question three. 
Templates, I'm just going to completely duck that question because I don't have the expertise yet. Hopefully coming soon. So quickly run through the experience we've had looking at this at Bloomberg over the last month or so, because we're trying to get ahead of the curve and figure out how these are actually going to work well for us. So quick description of the Bloomberg architecture for why we think this should map really well to modules and then what we discovered. So across our software, we build out a component. So a component is a header CPP file pair. And it basically defines a single class interface in the header, definition in the CPP file. Uh, mod uh, components are aggregated into packages. A package is nothing but a collection of components. With a modular nothing, we've got organizational rules that come about this, but its contents are just a collection of, of components. Then we have a package group that is similarly an aggregation of packages. No higher levels of, un of aggregation than package groups. And the important rule we have that happens to map well to the module structure, we do not allow cycles between components, never mind but, you know, within a package. Not, if you have a cycle, it has to be isolated down to the single header CPP pair. So this looks like a really good architecture to port and try the new module system with. And our initial mapping, component forms a single module, because that's really easy, and it's now a single file. Module, interface, definition below it, sorted. Then a package is a module that comprises, through you know, imports and exports, re-exports, all the component modules it had. And similarly, the package group is a, a module that re-exports all the packages that it comprises. So it should map really ne neatly through to the, uh, the module system. And it just didn't quite work that way. Because if I export and import, which is how you would chain these dependencies, I'm exporting a dependency on ultimately the, the package module, the, sorry, the component module. So it's a reference, not a by value. So what we wanted to end up with was a world where we just go, here's our package group module, that's what you depend on, and all the internal organization of all these sub-modules that we built it out of isn't visible in the shipping package. What we end up with is, yes, you can just import that package group, but we have to ship a few thousand other modules along with it because it's got the dependencies on all those more fine-grained modules, which was not the ideal solution. And I've got two questions coming up. Oddly enough, both from the... <laughs> <laughs> David. So what if you, you know, if, if your library distribution happens to be one file or many files, how does that change the user's experience? So the question is, so what? So we've got a few thousand files, how does that affect the user experience? It's going to, what should have been a single atomic import is now going to be a much more fine-grained, the, the header dance you go into the file system, it will not be as rattly because it's not well, greatly magnified. Like, the oh, the, in the source code, repeating the question, what will the user experience be? Yeah, for, in terms of interacting with the code, if they follow our rules and just import the package group in their source code, it will look the same. But because we're now exporting all those smaller rules, they can break our architectural rules and directly import just the little thing they were after and we didn't want necessarily to expose those finer grain details, our architectural unit is the big agglomeration. So I'll give you a quick comeback and then I'm moving. Okay, so can't that problem be solved with some kind of static analysis to enforce that kind of dimension? So the problem is, you know, couldn't we solve that with static analysis tools? And well, again, talking with the folks working on modules, they agree that actually they really do want to build systems this way. We just haven't necessarily got that syntax yet. And this is part of the thing we'll learn that if we deal with the thousands of submodules, tiny modules, if that works, we don't need to build a bigger way to comprise these things. It might turn out we want syntax there. This is what we want to learn by getting the modules TS out early and getting feedback. And we're trying now in Bloomberg to be part of that feedback process. I'll go John and then Gore. Okay, so today when we have a package group, we do static linking. We, we, we pull out of the package group just what we need mm -hmm. at the component granularity. I'm wondering if modules will impact to make our package group look more like shared libraries, monolithic shared libraries. I should probably pick this up so you're, with you offline. John's saying that when we 
export our package group and people start picking components from it, they pick just the few bits they need. And is this turning into a much larger monolithic, monolithic dependency? And well, what we ship is an archive, a compiled, share, a compiled library that is everything. We don't ship smaller libraries. The only library we ship is the library of everything. But we do ship lots of fine-grained headers. My specific question is, when I link against that library, so when you link against that library, all of it in my it, it'd be exactly the same as linking against that same library today because we're building that same library. Okay. All that's changing is the distribution of the million headers. Putting the million headers into one place. That that is the intended goal, but that's not quite how it'll work out in the first iteration. I need to get there in a couple of hands and then move on. Uh, I was told to speak into your microphone. <laughs> I, I can just speak to uh, to, to, to I'm going to drag yeah. you over here. Yes. Okay. See you back okay. on camera. So the clarification is that even if you have to re-export uh, millions of little modules, they will be all be sections in the archive. So you still end up giving customers a single archive with compiled code, OBJ, and interface files. Uh, second clarification is that uh, you have to redistribute the modules only those that you import from your interface files. If you split up your code into interface and implementation, then those modules that you import from the implementation files, they're statically linked, compiled into the OBJ, so those will not get re-exported. So that's a clarification on the Microsoft implementation. There's nothing in the specification that says you're going to build one big archive. We hope that many implementations will choose to do it that way because that should be so much more efficient on the, file, on the actual build process. Last question before I move on. So how would this work as a uh, distribution of um, sort of open source projects or anything like that? Like the idea of, okay, I built something, it depends on this module, but I'm actually going, I'm, I'm, ex I'm exporting a module, but I depend on these like six other ones, and then I'm gonna get my module out in the wild, mm -hmm. and then someone wants to use it, now they have an implicit dependency on these six ones, and what happens about versioning? What happens when things change in those sub-modules? If I understand that, I'm exporting definitions from these modules, and I'm assuming they're static and they're never changing, but it could change if someone now has a linking them all together problem. So the question is, what happens if I'm working with third-party modules that are outside my control, specifically in open source projects, and they're moving on their own separate update cycles, and how do we deal with versioning and a lot of other interesting issues that I'm sure we'll have some more feedback once we've got more experience with the modules TS. I don't think anything in there fundamentally changes that today from how you would have the same pro It's basically just repackaging much more efficiently the same problems we have today. But we've now got a library unit as such that we might be able to use to address those problems as we start getting, we've got something to build on. But I don't think we have the answer to that yet. Is that reasonable, Gore? Gore agrees, I'm good. <laughs> I suspect there's, a, there's the beginning mm. of a package manager in there too. Yeah. So suggesting that there might be the beginning of a package manager in there. But again, that's all part of the build system and the tooling outside the actual compiler itself, or which is what the standard talks about. Let's try and get to concepts. So concepts is the other big feature, I think, that people are drooling about getting, hopefully, in C++20. So we know it's been a major feature. It's been a long time coming. Um, I think the first concepts talk I heard was from Gabrielle Dos Rice at ACCU in either 2004 or 2005. So it's been coming for a long time. Um, compared to the previous version that we tried for C++11, if you looked at the idea of concepts being used to check the definition of the functions, that's no longer part of the feature proposal. Um, I should have had a slide about that, but um, this is generally a good thing. The example I will give you is traditional Cout debugging. I'm, something's a bit funky in my code. I can't quite figure out what it is, so I just want to write out a couple of lines to see what was the state of the program at this point. Well, if I do that, I've now introduced a dependency that the types that I'm passed are streamable. And if they didn't have that feature, I've now got to push that all the way up the hierarchy of calls that got me down there, do my debugging, figure it out, and then pull it all out because I don't want to change the world. Uh, there's a question going up at the back. So the question is, couldn't I just remove the constraint? And no, I can't, because we're constraint checking. If I remove the constraint, the function can no longer prove that my implementation is satisfied by just the constraints I gave it. 
So if I make my function unconstrained, things that are depending on it no longer have the guarantees that they needed and they were doing the proofs. So it leaks out very quickly. And having looked at the system, we, we had weight check was a way to try to do this locally, but it changed the overload resolution rules in there because within weight check it's kind of like embedding exactly what you described within a function. And I think you know, having seen what we've got now and what we had then, it could perhaps be made to work. But you just end up with a very different system and it's not clear that it's better than what we have because you get, you get different trade-offs. But it's not going to be very compatible with the template system we have. It would be a complete replacement and we're not ready to jump to that level of a change at this point. So by design now, there was a theory that we might be able to get to check definitions from where we are. That might still be open in the future in another decade when people want to do that. But it's off the table. It, it, and if we don't get there, that could be a good thing. That, so the question is, couldn't we just do this with a flag or some local control mechanism to relax the constraint checks around here? Or an attribute yeah. And I, as I said, this is what late check did in C++ OX before we ripped that version of concepts out. And now it really caused very strange problems with how your functions were behaving within the late check was completely inconsistent with how they were behaving and proving outside that. So our experimental evidence is it didn't work. <coughs> So it's a good question there that I don't have an answer to because it sounds like it might actually be right. <laughs> but I've not had time to think about it, which is when we did all this experiment back in C++ OX days, we didn't have if const expert that was added to C++ 17. Could if const expert be the part that says, well, I will just check if this part is locally satisfies those constraints. And if I happen to have that extra information within my function definition, now I can take advantage of it and do my debug streaming. And I think... Uh, Looking from a million miles away, sounds like that might work. So, darn you, you're making concepts even more complicated than we <laughs> We probably do need to take a look into that before we get a million miles down the line of baking and standardizing what we have. Even if we don't do that now, we want to make sure if that looks like it can work, we're not closing up the doors that we might need to walk through later. No, I mean, the looking at what we've been doing with the expectation that you can do constraint checks, you know, con check the definitions of your function templates, check that there's nothing about our model that has closed the ability to do that for other reasons. Make sure that we're able to extend into that if the if const expert trick works. But at the moment, we don't do constraint checking in, in function definitions. If there's things we need to do that, and our current design has closed off the ability to extend in that direction, before we didn't care as much. Now it sounds much more interesting that it might work again. It becomes a much more interesting thing that we really have to be sure we've not closed an extension in the future down. I don't know if we have or haven't, because I've just not looked into the question. John. So I just want to reemphasize that you have check definitions. It makes the code extremely brittle, and you're, you, you can change the meaning of what you're doing by altering the concept. What I want to suggest is there is always the opportunity to check the definitions with an external static analysis tool that you choose to run. That's fine. That's no problem at all, right? So John's suggestion is that once you have checked bodies, your code actually becomes very brittle. You know, very small, subtle changes are liable to break things or change meanings. And if we're just looking for that kind of a static check, rather than build it into the language, perhaps we can get the right effect from static analysis tools. And perhaps the rat's the right place to do that kind of verification. Yeah. I'll give you one, and then I'm moving on. So, 
moving back to where we are. So current proposal, we, we've given up for the moment the idea of checking function bodies. Uh, we've got the ranges TS, um, which is currently going through ballot review. I think it's pretty much finished. It's just a bit, hopefully we'll go out to publish it at the next meeting. This is a good now proof of concept of using those concepts. Uh, we've got the notion of terse syntax, which is now being rebranded the normal form, which I'll get to shortly, which turns out to be vital when you're trying to use polymorphic lambdas. So it's not an optional feature. Uh, but it, it raises some interesting concerns that might make people nervous in other directions. So I've got a couple of interesting c comments on there. This is, again, very much one to my personal view of things I would like to fix about concepts and my chances of fixing things <laughs> at this point. But hopefully, you know, fire off some synapses and people might see what I've missed and how to really fix this. I know David Sankel's got some other interesting ideas, which is why I say I'm definitely not a Bloomberg position here. We have differing opinions of how to solve the same problem. Uh, specifically, I'm going to get to the forwarding problem with uh, syntax. So my assumption is that you've all hopefully got a vague idea of what I mean when I'm talking about concepts. Does anyone not have a clue about concepts? I'm in the right room, good. So current state of the art. Concepts TS was published November 15th, 2015. So it's no, and it's no longer called Concepts Lite. This is just Concepts. Um, GCC 6.1 shipped um, an implementation, which you can now access with the F concepts flag. Uh, GCC 6, and we're on to GCC 7 now. So hopefully it's been continuing to evolve and you know, get bug fixes and things. Um, the LEWG is hard at work building the ranges TS that's really going to validate your experience with that model of concepts. Features of note. Um, concepts, there's two declaration forms. You can declare them like a variable or declare them like a function. The main difference being you can't overload variable templates, but you can overload function concepts. And occasionally that may or may not matter. Uh, the reason this is of note is there's a question of, is it confusing to have two mostly the same forms that, and our experience from, using, from trying to use them in the, the uh, ranges TS is that for consistency, the authors had to pick one or chose to pick one, and the only one that was fully general was the function-like form. Therefore, there's a question of can we simplify the feature just by dropping the support for the variable-like form? Does it really bring value, or is it just exposing us to inconsistencies? And at the moment, adopting concepts as written, we will get both. My understanding, the feedback they gave was they used the, the function form, but if they could mm -hmm. choose to have just one, it would be the variable form. Mm -hmm. So the question was, you know, yes, uh, feedback from the concepts from the ranges TS authors is yes, they use the function form, but their preference, if they could to get away, it would be just the syntax of the variable form is much nicer. So uh, if there turn out to be no really special cases that do need the overloading, that might be the nicer one to pick. And maybe some ideas about how to go around, work around in that, that space. But I say this is a high level. Just try to flag up a few of the ideas here. Otherwise, concepts are mandated. The always, it's a function concept that returns bool. It's a variable template that is bool. And the bool is baked into the concept syntax. If all it can ever be is bool, why do we need to say it? Maybe we can just clean this up a little bit. Do we really think this is a vital extension point into the future? Um, requires expressions. To say, does my thing satisfy this? Requires expression. Um, is currently usable only in requires clauses when I'm constraining a template. I can't use it in a regular constant e expression evaluation. And the, I think the proposal to, act, to relax that was accepted at the last meeting. So that actually will now be, if we were to do a future modules TS, a, a revision of the one we've got, that would be landing in that working paper. If that goes straight into the standard, it will come along at that point. So it's not in a shipping document yet, but it's now in theory in, theory in one of our working papers. So what do we get from concepts? Eventually, it's a much more expressive, so cleaner to read and efficient for the compiler way to create spin eye conditions. Uh, Constraint-based overloading will pick the best match for you with what would otherwise look like identical function signatures in C++ 17, such as overloading on forward iterators and random access iterators. So that solves a whole lot of the tag dispatch, or other funny, clever ways to go around about that. And it's an extremely flexible system for declaring syntax, for declaring constraints. And when I say flexible, I mean it's very easy to find seven ways to say the same thing. 
and there's a reason that each of those seven exist. But I don't think there's a reason that we need a complexity of seven. Maybe there's something we can do to simplify this down to a smaller subset. I mean, part of this is it, it grew around the feature as it was evolving. Maybe we can synthesize it down to something simpler. <coughs> I've heard a few other people have got similar wishes. I've not yet heard of a, a cut down, simplified form that can be sold. So it, that might be a pipe dream, but I still hope that we can do something there. Can you say again what the seven things are? No. <laughs> I don't know what it is, what category? Is so the question is, what are the seven things I'm talking about? I say, if I'm writing a function template and I'm going to constrain it with concepts, okay. I might find seven completely different ways to say this, write the same function declaration. Seven is an actual number you just made it up? It's, it's around about seven, plus or minus one. Okay. Off the top of my head. If I'm constraining on a single, constraining a single argument on a single concept, I might find seven different ways to say the same thing. And do they all partially order at the same priority? It's, <laughs> and we get into these, look, it feels like unnecessary complexity. We certainly need more than one. There's a variety of reasons we need a bunch of these things, but I'm, I'm not convinced we need the full flexibility of putting requires in you know, three or four different places and so forth. So, uh, did I finish on that slide? Yeah. And there's more. Um, the normal form is the form that actually looks just like a regular function. And where you would see types, we just drop in concepts. And the way you know the difference between the two is you just know your darn code. <laughs> It's your job to know you're now looking at a template and not a regular function with types. Some people are freaked out by that. Some people are getting more comfortable but not entirely sold yet. But the fact is, if I'm trying to constrain a generic lambda, it's the only form I can use because there's no way to inject a template declaration in that nice short uh, syntax we use for lambdas. Okay, so we had a bold assertion that in C20, we are going to get <laughs> <laughs> template lambdas. There's a proposal for. Yeah, I mean, of course. Yeah. It's through EWG with no problem in core right now. Oh, and apparently it, it's making progress because it has passed through the group whose job is to filter are these requests good enough? And now it's just going through the baking of the standardies before it actually lands in the document. So, yes, okay. So, yes, it should be happening then. Sorry, I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Quick question then. So what do you think about the impact on, say, normal programmers or people who are trained to do this? Are we going to start getting Can I go through my, walk through my <laughs> example now? <laughs> the question is how is this going to apply to normal programmers? Let's take a look at this function. Quick question. Can I call this function with an L value or not? Depends. Depends on whether R type is a, oh yeah. <laughs> Have you been looking at my slides? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So we need to know that. So there's been a proposal way back. <laughs> it's in no, red. It's, it's in red because. <laughs> the, yes, it is. It's in red because the syntax is horrible. Please put aside the idea that we're just going to go plus one on the number of ampersands for counting. I'm trying to get. I don't have a better syntax yet. And this, this is not my proposal, not my syntax, although this is my tweak upon that proposal that was floating around a few years ago. So the problem with this is that C17 or 03, 98 templates do funny things when they see a double ampersand because it's going to deduce was it an L value or an R value reference. And we now call them forwarding references to try to make that clear. But it really isn't clear when you're reading code. And it becomes much less clear when I'm passing somebody else's code. And I, don't, I just see identifiers. And I'm reading, they've written great code. It reads like English. So I'm just intuiting as I'm reading and then digging in when I need to see something I don't understand. I now need to know if every single one of those identifiers is a concept, just to know if that will bind to R values. So I, I want to get the proposal before I take hands. So the notion here is we just have a reference that really is a forwarding reference. And then regardless of whether archetype is a type or a concept, it's going to do the deduction and say I bound to an L value or an R value depending on how you called me. Which means that even for a regular type, and this is my extension on what was being proposed before, this now becomes 
like another mini template. Because we're now familiar with that, because that's what the normal form of concepts does. So that could no longer be scary. Now, when this was originally proposed, they weren't proposing it for regular types. It was just an extension for templates. I think if we port it back to regular types, it actually starts to make a lot more sense. And it makes code like this, where I'm trying to say, is this forwarding or not? Does this bind to an R value or an R value? Use a syntax that makes it clear I want to do that deduction. No, because no code's written using the normal form yet, because it's not in C17. It will break if code. Type is a type, then you don't know it's a template. If, I mean, suddenly if it's a type, the, the, repeat the question. If this is a type, I still don't know because it's not a template. No, even if this is a type, with as soon as I put a forwarding reference, it's a true forwarding reference, it becomes a template, just like if I had a concept using normal form. Yes, but that breaks functions that actually expect arguments by move because they're already mm -hmm. specifying their type with a reference, mm -hmm. and suddenly that's a forwarding mm -hmm. reference. No, because count, count the ampersands. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's in red. It's horrible. <laughs> but it makes a semantically new thing. And that's why we can put it in now. It won't break existing code because this is not valid syntax today. You don't do this with types today. You don't even have the funny identifier. And we don't have normal form today. So it's reasonable to, th I, I postulate, it's reasonable to think about doing this to help tame this feature when we're using normal form in C++ concepts. What about our beautiful collapsing rules? <laughs> what about our beautiful reference collapsing rules? Um, sorry, I just took which slide I'm on. Uh, uh, so. Yeah, I, I love this. Uh, uh, I forgot which slide I have this on. Yeah, this is the one. Second bullet. The problem we have is unconstrained templates are out in the wild. They do have this wonderful reference collapsing behavior. An unconstrained template will still do what it does. We'll just deprecate that behavior. We're, we're stuck with it almost forever. But we can tell people we've got a better way of doing things this now. You find that confusing, but you start writing code this way, the language becomes a lot cleaner. It's just this horrible thing you have to learn when you deal with legacy code. Because legacy code is always horrible anyway. So the other thing that comes out is now when I see a double ampersand with the normal form, it means I know it binds only to R values, which is a really difficult thing to express with our O3 template syntax. I've got to introduce funny spin eye constraints, and I could now perhaps write a concept to do that, but it would be just much nicer if the language that was intuitive for doing that did that. So that's why I hope I might see some traction on this going forward. It's a long shot at this point, but Knowing whether or not we have that, that is vital when you're trying to start building library interfaces going forward. Yeah, a variety of tokens could go there. I'm completely not proposing the syntax. This is the syntax that was in the original proposal for adding something for this, and I wasn't going to bike shared a better syntax on the fly, because I'm not sure there is one. I hate it, but I think it might be the least awful <laughs> once you go through all the rest. There has been an official proposal uh, for unary write shifts. I'm not a fan, but I just want to say there has been a proposal for a better syntax. That, so there's been a proposal for a better syntax using unary write shift. Is that unary write shift to do this? No, or unary write shift to do something completely different? It's to fault, not to accept. Oh. Okay, so this is the idea of the, you know, the forwarding part. Because my other notion, sorry, I'll just finish off my slide, is um, once we've got this, within this mini template, we can implicitly say when I call, call forward with my type, it knows whether I was given an L value or an R value, and it just forwards and there's nothing more to say. And standard forward doesn't become redundant because we still need it for the old legacy code. But code just becomes much cleaner if the forwarding problem, the syntax is just pass me a forwarding reference. Main problem I see with this, just I was thinking about this on the way in, is overloading ambiguities when I've got overloads on multiple references and which one wins. And I don't want to get into that now because I really do want to get moving on. I'm down to 30 minutes and i am still got a few slides on my second of the dozen or so features I wanted to talk about. So sorry I'm cutting short because I have a second point I want to make on concepts. And this one is definitely more uh, dubious, but this is 
my discomfort with some of the aspects that come out. So here's the way we might write uh, the parallel copy function today in C++17. And here's how we might write it using concepts. Uh, so we go into the template head, we say we've got an execution policy, we've got two forward iterators that satisfy the appropriate concepts. And of course we want to write, want to write that in the normal form, which ends up looking like this. And now we've lost the ability to say, do first, last, and result deduce to always the same type or to three different types. We've lost something that the library knew it had to do by tagging the forward declaration just to make sure they're different types. And my proposal was simply add tagging to the concept to say these things will deduce as separate groups. And that way I now know that if I see forward iterator dot one, any reference to forward iterator dot one in that function refers to the same type. And it means that when I'm looking at the interaction between concepts with a tag, they act on the page very much the way like types do today. Now I've heard people formulating another view of types where this would be utterly alien and the rules that are in the concepts today are actually much more intuitive for people who are familiar with writing a lot of generic code. And I think this therefore is going to be a very hard sell. But certainly this feels a lot more intuitive to me when I'm trying to sit down and just write normal form code. So this, this is, forget a long shot, this is, you know, not even a moon shot, this is an Alpha Centauri shot. But <laughs> So the, the notion was that, you know, so this is similar to what we're seeing, I, or will be seeing, I guess, in the keynote, it's coming about Rust with tagging for its lifetimes. And again, my note here, my note, where I think they do, do with quotes and potentially different sequences of identifiers. My notion here, by the way, is it can be any identifier or even starting with a digit. It doesn't need to be just numbers in there, but. I don't see why it's not intuitive to say that when it's. Sorry, we're going to have to take that one offline. Someone's saying it's not intuitive. I, there are people in the room who think this is not intuitive, so. At the moment, it does. At the moment, they deduce to be the same type. We, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, this is getting too deep. For, yeah. I, I've let us drop too deep on a few of these. I want to get on because I've got to hit a few other language features. So, again, that was notion of tagging on concepts. Again, the other th here's the example showing. The idea is if I use these for variable declarations within the function, it, the, the tags apply all the way through the same scope where the tag was introduced. That would be the idea. Next feature, contracts. <laughs> You're going to hate this, John, I'm afraid, but. <laughs> so, I, to my mind, it, it's the, uh, it's notionally, it's the runtime analog of concepts. Concepts are how you interact and make constraints on the type system. Contracts are much more how you make constraints on the values you're observing at runtime. So it's for better testing and support of software because if I've got these constraints all the way through my code and I can build in modes that let me test that, that's awesome. It clearly supports better static analysis because the static analysis tools can now pull out this information about what your program's expecting and giving us guarantees that it's going to deliver. So the idea is we're going to specify in code the rights and responsibilities, as I call it, uh, on the core of a function. So the basic idea of the proposal that's currently going through, it's made its first pass now through the evolution group. We're sending it off to the library evolution group to see if the library evolution folks think it's fit for purpose. And hopefully we'll come back with a yay, but we'll find out in Toronto. So we're using a modified attribute syntax. Expect colon predicate is the precondition that the caller must supply. It's the caller's job, if they don't satisfy that precondition, they're out of contract. It's their bug. Uh, ensures predicate says, this is what I'm going to guarantee if the function returns correctly. If I throw an exception, all bets are off. You don't know. I, I, we're not providing contracts that guarantee, you know, exception safety guarantees in the event of an exception coming out because you don't want to lose yourself in a mess of annotation. But it is important to know what the function is going to guarantee to deliver 
for static analysis tools to see, to be able to chain preconditions to, to post conditions or expects to ensures. And that, if that fires, that's a bug in the implementation of that function. So again, we're getting the responsibility of, you know, when you find a bug, whose bug was it? And finally, we have the notion of a cert, of a predicate, which you just put into implementation. The expects and ensures go on the declaration of a function. The assert is for testing additional things that you might want to document. Uh, one of the concerns is once you start decorating a function with too many expects and ensures, is the function declaration still readable? There's a balancing act to figure out how is this going to feel in practice when we start using this. We, so a little bit of experience would be good. The Bloomberg experience, of course, is we just use a cert. We have no interest in expects and ensures. And I know there's other groups that are much more interested in expects and ensures and have no interest in a cert. And hopefully this feature is going to work well for all of us. But it does bring up an interesting question when you start talking about library design, which we'll probably talk about tomorrow. The, yes, essentially. You're not allowed to have, it's a question, is the predicate required to be pure? Yes, you, it's, we say it's undefined behavior if you have side effects in your predicates. So why not buy a cert? But it's, we're waving our hands and saying it's undefined behavior. You still get what you get. I don't, uh, it's. Why don't you want So. <laughs> Violation handlers. So we, we, we've decorated our code with these predicates that say, you know, conditions that hold at various points in the code. So I'm now running my program. I'm in a, I built it to say, please run all those checks. And I, hey, that predicate suddenly came back false. What's going to happen? We're going to trigger a violation handler. Um, violation handlers will be specified on the build line. You do not specify these in code at runtime. So once they're set, they're installed by the build system and they're immutable at that point because there's real security risks. If you're running code that now is supposed to be behind some kind of secure domain or you know, secure firewall in the code that is firing off assertions, you really don't want people hijacking your violation handler. So the build system will lock that down. On the other hand, if you do want the ability to install your own violation handler at runtime, common thing we actually do at Bloomberg, you can lock down one that has its own registration mechanism. So we're not taking away the ability to register at runtime, but you're actively making a choice to do that and implementing that runtime registration yourself. And there's a second flag we're going to throw in here, which is, is now finally putting constraints on the build system, which is a novel thing for the standard. So this is still an interesting thing to tease its way through. It's not made it to the core working group yet. A flag to say whether or not that violation handler is allowed to resume. Typically, when you spot a bug, you want to tear the system down, give a message on the console and say, hey, this crazy thing fired, but I want to minimize my damage to the rest of the world. I don't want to be writing out data and corrupting databases and executing financial transactions and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Tear the system down. That's our default behavior. But if I'm trying to add this feature to an existing code base, one of the things I want to do is make sure that I don't have any of those assertions already firing. And I'm going to do that by running the system. What I might want to do is install a logger in the handler instead. So I run it in my safe environment. I run the software, I collect logs and go, is it running clean? Great. Otherwise, gee, I've already got a good set of things I need to fix before I can actually enable it for production with those checks tearing the system down. Clearly, we don't want that to be the default behavior because it's part of the notion of security that comes out of this, but we need that feature. So the, the question is, why do we have a separate flag as opposed to just install a handler that in turn is flagged no return? I can't remember what your answer, our answer for that was. The answer for that is, in large, large companies, hmm. we, have, we have people who install the handler, hmm. we have people who build the software. And if the head of the company says, it will not return, hmm. we need a way to be separate from the, from the, the callback hmm. to say, I don't care what callback hmm. you put in, but it ain't returning. Or, it is okay to return because this is existing software and we're going to instrument it so that we can get to that good state. 
I, I think we're getting, I, I've got 10, 20 minutes to get through That's another. What, what people yeah. ask. David Scott, for yeah. example, asks this question. I've gone the wrong way on my slides again. So restrictions, the handle can't change at runtime. And likewise, the predicates that you have access to in the expects and the ensures and even the assert are limited by the access specification of the function uh, uh, that you're calling. So if it's a public function, it can access only public members of that class. If it's protected, it can't, still can't access the private parts, but it can still see the protected. So it's not you know, a funny backdoor around you know, ac access control. And it means that you're checking conditions that the caller of your function is also in a position to check because they could just run that code themselves and say, hey, if I don't satisfy the preconditions, I will not call the function. And they've got an easy way to do that. If you're relying on implementation details they can't access, they can't write their checks and write their code safely. So the other notion we have here is what we're calling checking levels. And this comes down to not all checks are cheap. Classic example, I'm writing a sort algorithm and I want to write my post condition on the sort. And the is sorted part is fairly easy and will run in linear time and isn't going to violate the big owner cost of running my um, sort function. But the second required part is that it's also a permutation of the original input sequence. And that's a much more expensive check. And I certainly don't want to be running that every time I call sort. But I do want to have the ability to have what we're calling an audit mode where I can run these much more expensive checks because something crazy is going on in my software. So I really want to say, OK, I'll, I'm going to be in my debug world. I'm going to take the extra expense of running it. And I can now have these much more thorough checks and know that my performance has gone to heck. And a third level we're having is something called axioms. And axioms are essentially information for static analysis tools. These are code that will never run. There is absolutely no build mode that can be enabled that will run those checks. So we can have references to functions that are never defined because although I, just, I have to satisfy name lookup to find it, its meaning is entirely known to the static analyzer. A classic example being, you know, is a valid pointer. I can check it's not null, but that doesn't mean it's valid. So if you want these kinds of checks, axioms can be quite useful. So some concerns that are st still baking in the proposal that's working its way through. We've got some fairly clear ideas of what we think we want here, but they're still going through some of the feedback. What information should we pass to the violation handler? So a classic assumption would be from what we get in C99, which is the assert macro we have today, is file, line number, function name, and source code, uh, the expression that failed, st stringized. Um, if we start having that embed, all that information embedded all the way through all of our system, that can actually be a huge overhead in a production system. We might want flags to say, I'll pass less, but still have that same signature that goes through to the, um, the violation handler. The, the odds are we're going to have the violation handler just take a pointer to a structure or a structure by reference, so we can extend the structure in the future and just put in you know, the basic building blocks that we're going to need. And some of that might come from a feature that's currently going through the library TS2, I think, which is a source code information, which will try and catch the idea of file and line number at runtime for us. So there's already other proposals in this space that we might be able to lean on to provide some richer information here. I have a question. Uh, among the information that you mentioned that is passed, mm -hmm. I recently bumped on the issue that application name is sometimes needed because the same code can be in multiple applications, and we need mm. to know which application outputs that line. So the observation was that we might also need the application name as well as the information I'm already given. Um, and one answer there could be install your own violation handler that is also going to write out the application name that you're going to capture and write to some accessible space when you pass main. So you have the control to add that with your own violation handler if you want. So, but w whether that's something that we could think about adding to the um, base base system, we'll. That's what that's where I'm coming for feedback. So, let's see. The other question we have is much more experienced thing. What's the right level of contract specification we want to be putting on our function signatures so that we're extracting really useful information, but not blinding the user with science so they can't actually see the function anymore? And just quick example. 
Um, one of the ideas is that if we're doing a new library, we have a new vector, perhaps putting an expect on the, the operator square bracket means we no longer need to also supply at, which is a much maligned function. Still not clear, but you know, this is a, one of the, has been given as one of the motivating examples for going into this space. And just an example, just to throw the insurers up that after an insert, I'm going to ensure the container's not empty. It's not a big deal, but it's an easy thing that you can. I don't understand why, why is insert, I don't understand. Because if I have an empty container and I insert, after I've inserted, because it's returned, the container will no longer be empty. If it was not empty beforehand, it will still not be empty. Oh, this is a post condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing I've not mentioned here, this is, I, I, you, you always discover as you're presenting the slides what you've missed. Um, post conditions. Do I check the value that was present on entry to the function of a parameter or the value on exit? And the answer is, for at least the first iteration, we don't want to put any fancy syntax in there because the feature's already complex enough and we want to constrain complexity. So the requirement is the value is the same. If it makes a difference, then you can't use a post condition to express that today. It means that you, a function that has a post condition on one of its in parameters should treat that parameter as const throughout the function. Therefore, if you're going to change it, make a copy internally and work on that copy. we have access to a reference there, it's not come by value. So the question is, I can't, if I've got uh, the, con the move construct, a move on a unique putter, I want to have the ensures clause that says the unique putter I've moved from is now empty, I can't do that. But because I've got a reference, the reference isn't rebinding. So I can still query the state through the reference or through a pointer, that's fine. It's only when something passes by value, we have to treat the value as const. Sorry? Can, can you put the Yes, yes, sorry. Can you put ensures on the return value? Yes, you can. There's a syntax for that. I've not put it in the slides. Thank you. Coroutines. Trying to run through it. Um, yeah, I'm late. <laughs> Trouble when you give something for the first time, you think you've got, you know, far too few slides, and then you're looking and saying, I'm on, you know, slide 51 of 87. So I've made it about two-thirds of the way. Um, the, the, the next few sections are actually quite a bit shorter because my main focus is on the, the big three things that I was focused on for my wish list. So coroutines, championed by our wonderful man here, Gordon Shinov. Um, and they're going through the TS process of the standard at the moment. Um, they're currently out for comments. So the, 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 the TS is in review. Uh, coroutines effectively allow you to exit and, re, re, exit and return from a function and then resume where you left off. And it's the basic idea of, you know, if you're familiar with other languages that have the notion of generators, which is essentially the idea of a, a range being expressed by executing a function repeatedly. And um, asynchronous coroutines turn out to be incredibly valuable, returning something that's you know, kind of a bit like a future, so that it's a much cleaner way to start writing asynchronous code going forward, we hope. In terms of language level impact, the proposal has three new keywords, uh, all Prefix with a co underscore, I'm afraid you can shoot me for that one. Um, we're always going to have trouble with yield as a keyword because it's way too abused everywhere else. I had a really hard time trying to figure out something was a coroutine when it used return and not co-return. Or it's just some other way of saying, if the only way I know it's a coroutine is because it's got a funky return semantic and it's got the same keyword, it was very subtle to figure out. So yeah, I championed the co underscore, but applying it consistency, Oh wait, wasn't so much of a problem, but we want the code consistently there. My fault, sorry. Not sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, these are the syntax we use to create a coroutine, and we can also use co-await in a for loop to effect effectively have an asynchronous for loop. And coroutine traits allow for custom implementation of your own coroutine mechanisms. Why are coroutines um, important? 
They're going to simplify a lot of our programming models for asynchronous code. And in terms of when I'm thinking for, this is all about STD2, knowing if we can have generators to feed into our range-based algorithms is a fundamental thing to be aware of as we start designing and composing how we want our vocabulary for those algorithms. So I think this is a really important thing to land as soon as we can to start working with interactions with our ranges TS. That's why it's you know, on my important issues list. Quick example. Um, yeah, I'm running out of time, so although I spent a little while getting drag uh, go to make sure I got these uh, co examples right just before I gave the talk, I have no time to go through them. Unified call syntax. There's a wonderful convention going around the library these days that we've got member functions begin, end, and size, and empty, and a bunch of these other things, and now we're unpackaging them, unpackaging them as free functions as well, because often libraries want to provide these more as a customization point, so we call them as a free function, and the, um, you can then you know, put, adapt to other people's libraries or play around in more interesting ways, but you know you have to invoke ADL as you call them. And this is seen perhaps as a symptom of a problem rather than a solution. So the idea here is we have a single syntax that says I will call a function. If I find it as a free function or as a member function, depending on how I call it, great. And if I don't, I can look at the other one. And if I find the other one, then it didn't matter how the code was written, I can call it in a consistent manner. That's the theory. This is on my list of things I don't want. <laughs> So the concerns come managing the overload sets as I've now got multiple concerns here, it gets very tricky. And effectively you're making every function name an extension point in generic code. Because if somebody's now adding member functions, which they, they couldn't add member functions before, but they're now adding a free function that my member function is going to find. And writing generic code, it's already stepping on eggshells sometimes. And I just don't want to have, I don't have the mental overhead to deal with that. And so, yeah, to an extent, you know, this one concerns me. There's also the notion that at least for controlling the overload sets and some of these things, we might have, um, I've got an example here, a new syntax for invoking the function calls where you go dot function name. And that says, rather than just defaulting into this uniform, I, I check all these things, at least I'll have a clear extension that says I've intentionally gone into that world. But that doesn't take away my fears as a library vendor that you've now made every function an extension point, even my members, which previously you couldn't extend. So I'm the official FUD campaign on that one. So default comparisons. Uh, I'm gonna have to run through this way too quickly for, what it's, for the number of slides I have on it, but um, Herb Sutter came up with a, it's been a long-standing problem that there's an intuitive definition for defining comparison operators for our types. And we've got standard relops was kind of supposed to do that for us. It doesn't work. Uh, partly because people don't like even using namespace to whatever in their code, especially in their headers, which is where you've got to do it if it works for your own types. But we also didn't just create a simple empty tag type we could derive from that would therefore put standard relops into your ADL lookup sets, which is what you're going to get with operators. So it would have just worked. But that's probably not the solution we want to do at this point. We just want relops to go away. So Herb's proposal is what we're calling the spaceship operator, this funky little TIE fighter. And basically evaluates to negative, zero, or positive with a traditional three-way comparison that you might find from C and other languages when they're doing comparisons. Devil's in the details, not all types have the same ordering properties. Some types are just equality comparable but don't have orderings. Some have equivalent but not equal states. So we end up with a taxonomy of the types you can return that are all basically wrapping it in that is negative, zero, or positive. So there's a bit of devil in the details here. I don't want to dive into that taxonomy now. Luckily, I didn't prepare slides on that. But the idea is, once we have this spaceship operator, we might just define that and say, I can let all these other ones be synthesized if they're needed. So we demand if we do that, that we have all the usual relationships hold but as you can see, I've got the exact expression on the left is what the user's calling, and on the, in the middle and the right, either of those would satisfy an implementation using an implicitly generated call with the spaceship operator. 
I saw hands I'm going to have to run on fast, I'm afraid. Here's our example of how you might implement the spaceship operator taken directly from Herb's paper. Note the really neat use of C++ initialize, if with initializer. It, it's just a nice little example like this. I, I love it when it, they just fall out. So. And again, for a default definition, if I could just equal default, it will do what you saw on that other slide. And the nice thing, if I'm getting a default definition, we've done default definitions in the language before. We do them for some constructors and for some assignment operators. When the compiler's providing the definition, all it needs to check is a small number of things, and it, it doesn't need to check every expression down there, just inquiring its types. It knows are these types no except on these operations. So we can, in, it's another place where we can implicitly deduce correctly the no except ex exception specification. That's all I've got on that one. Concept, overloading context bar. Um, so there's a real desire running around at the moment, and I'm sure you've seen that this week already, to make more and more of the standard library context bar and context bar friendly. But we also don't want to start paying runtime penalties because somebody thought, here's a cute trick I can make this function context bar. If I just implement it this way, in particular, it means giving up your assembly and intrinsics that might be vital for getting some really optimal performance out of some runtime algorithms. So it'd be really nice if we could just say, if when I call that function, I see it's a context per context, I call the context per version of the code. And if it's a runtime context, I call your highly optimized version. And two solutions here. One would just be to allow literally overloading on the context per keyword. And the other, which I prefer, is to introduce some kind of intrinsic like is context per eval, so that compile time is true if I'm in a context per evaluation context, <laughs> and false otherwise. And that would look something like this in practice. So say we didn't have the intrinsic that's now required for char traits. This is how I might implement char traits as context, but while not giving up the optimizations I get from stir copy. Yep. So. And if we have something like this, we could even go one step further, which is me being very speculative to say, how important is the context per keyword on functions after this? Perhaps we can just try the evaluation, and if at the time we evaluate it, we find there wasn't a context per path through there. We do that with templates anyway. That's the time to give the error that that wasn't context per. And all context per then becomes is an assertion to the compiler. I really want you to make sure you can do this, so give me an error if the function doesn't compile as context per, but it's not a requirement that somebody tries calling it context per. Now, I'm not at all sure that that's even got a chance of flying. That's another Alpha Centauri shot, maybe. Maybe just a Mars shot. But I have 20 seconds to talk about reflection. <laughs> no. <laughs> no transactional memory, no proxy support. Um, so what was I looking to get out of this session? Basically, it, it's my wish list. I want to get, especially when you get the feedback session on Friday, from this group, which we think the vital architectural language features are that we want in at the ground level as we start designing another standard library. Which features are critical? Let's push to get those in C20. At which point, I'm already in spot deferring the new standard library to C23 because I didn't get the features till C20 that I wanted my foundation to build with. That's not clearly going to fly either. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, I also therefore want folks here to get excited and involved and trying to help you know, progress the state of the art with these. That doesn't necessarily mean coming up to committee meetings. It means getting involved with Quang and GCC and banging on these features and giving feedback of people who, who are using them to help develop them. Just let's get experience with the models so we can push these through more easily because when people come up and say, yes, we've been doing that and this is what happens, our, our conversations go a lot more easily when things are concrete and not theoretical. So I'm in a good group, I think, to get that kind of feedback. Um, the other thing is, therefore, to flag which features are nice to have. We want them all, presumably. But we can safely defer because we think we can incrementally add them to a library later. They're maybe not so critical to get in at the foundation level. <laughs> I'll take questions, but I am out of time. We're done. Thank you. Quick, are your slides online if we want to go um, Not yet, but they will be.